Thank you so much for joining us on Straight Out of Savannah. I am so excited. My guest, Melissa Harry, is here all the way from Hawaii, and I am super, super, super excited. So she's going to tell you a little bit about who she is, what it is that she does, and how she can help you. So Melissa, take it away. Aloha, everybody. Tammy, thank you for having me on the show. More importantly, thank you for all of your patience with me. Immensely appreciated. So I'm Melissa Harry. I'm a holistic practitioner. Um, I have had my gifts since childhood, and I've now come into full ownership of my gifts instead of working against them because that does not work. Yes, that is that's exciting because once you finally get there, you know, and I, I can say this from a child having those type of gifts as well. When I was a little tiny girl, <laughs> I always say when I was a little girl, my husband says, you're still a little girl. <laughs> but when I was a young girl, same thing, you know, we, we, you know, they had our healing and all these things and all the stuff. And, and I was like, no, I shut it down. Like, I don't know, probably I asked for that I see dead people gift to stop when I was a child because I it scared the mess out of me. I mean, you know, who do you even talk to about that kind of stuff? So share some of those experiences because yeah. I know that you've had some. It's funny that you went there because I have felt a very kindred spirit with you from the moment you popped up on my Facebook page. I don't even know how you ended up on my page, but I've just rolled with it. <laughs> um, so for me, I grew up with a great grandmother that was named my eye. And it was funny because I always thought it was because she had a glass eye from a farming accident, but it was actually because she had the gift of sight. And so all the people on Cape Cod, Howard, Hyannis, they would never come to the front door. They would never speak to her in the streets, but, oh, they'd love to be at the back door waiting for whatever goodies she had, a reading, herbs, you name it. So for me, that was the normalcy. I wasn't afraid of the dead people. I never asked them to leave me alone. I would go hang out with them in the cemetery. Um, if I was late for dinner, we knew I was in the cemetery because I was having a conversation. I went the other way. I went, hey, I want to know how to make a recipe of French perfume from the 17th century. What y'all spirits got on it? Okay. I went that's that so way. Cool. So I didn't run from it. <laughs> that's, that's the route I went. Yeah. And for me, I had to embrace it because I had been parentified by age six. My mother's very, very gifted healer. She was a nurse. She studied Western and Eastern medicine, but she also was a shaman healer in our culture. So I'm seventh generation. My mother was very powerful. However, she was schizophrenic, which goes with the power of people with great spirits. Yes. So for me, I couldn't run from those gifts. Because I had to understand all the demons and people that were talking to my mother and how they were going to impact my life and be able to jump in there and figure out what was real, what wasn't. So I got very good at developing my gifts. <laughs> and, um, you had to be right on it. Like, you just don't know. It got to the point where when my grandparents left the East Coast after our family factory closed down, they went out to California to start a new one through the prison system. And my mother and I were still on the East Coast, as was my grandmother's brother. So if my mother would go on what I like to call her walkabouts, her free spirit that doesn't like Western medicine, that wants to go off of her lithium and just kind of take a little mini vacation. Yeah. Sometimes I would know she'd come back. Sometimes she'd be gone too long. The only person I would let know she's been gone a while is my grandmother. She would call her brother on the Cape and he'd come and get me. We'd roll down the window of the family station wagon like I was a bloodhound. <laughs> and I'd look and I'd wait for the wind and the trees to tell me which direction. And that man would drive whatever direction I said. We went from Massachusetts all the way to New York. Bought my mother in Times Square. I was a six-year-old girl. <laughs> so talking to those spirits. Being able to speak schizophrenic, being able to know that in a psychotic state, the 
the way a tree or a sign is going to look to my mother and know that she'll either go towards it or away from it mm -hmm. and just getting in there. But more importantly, knowing that I could just sit still and close my eyes and ask everyone to help me censor mm -hmm. in which direction I was all over it. I've never failed finding her as a child or even as an adult, knowing when she's in trouble. That's awesome. Is, is your mother still with you? Yes, she's still with me. I'm um, still having a mighty battle of taking care of her in that um, I love God and I've nicknamed myself Joe Bet because I got jokes, he's got jokes. And um, Job is one of my favorite passages in the Bible because you talk about true understanding of faith of a mustard seed spirit and ignoring your friends that are telling you, yo, this ain't working, it's time to walk away. Um, I definitely am right there with Job. I'm not looking for the payday, but I'm right there. However, my Jobette tone is, yo, I'll follow you. I'll be submissive, but put some tools in my toolbox beyond my prayers and my hope. Um, so I'm still fighting the battle for my mother. She just turned 83 in April. She had been being abused by a co-resident in the facility where she lives. My TRO was denied, which I feel a certain way about that because I'm a former social worker. So what? knowing that I've saved people, that I cut my teeth on domestic violence in the Philippines at Clark Air Base, where we had the highest rate of domestic violence out of the entire Pacific fleet. Oh. Yes, because domestic violence goes against support in the mission. Those dependent spouses, they're not there for the Air Force or whatever military branch. They're there for that active duty personnel to keep him happy so he can stay on mission. So they don't care what's going on at home because they need him to do whatever it is. But knowing I that, know that, about that. I, right? I, all of my husbands were military. <laughs> First right. thing, so I know, right. I know, yeah. I have my baby's military, so I know, and I've seen right. a lot of them, yeah. Right, you're mm -hmm. going to get kicked out of the military quicker for being overweight and unable to perform your duties for them than any lifestyle issues you have, which should matter, but um, they used me, article that, 15, was a but that was, they used to article 15, them, but that was, um, and you know, that would hurt, especially, yes. When you yes. have a whole bunch of kids and you enlisted and you don't make no money. Yeah, no, trust me. Trust me. Because um, my ex came in out of basics and we were eager for that one stripe. Never mind. Oh, we got two now. <laughs> Going up the food chain and pay <laughs> while being stuck overseas. Mm -hmm. you so it's tough it. as dependents. <laughs> I remember when they were getting ready to, um, when they were uh, getting on alert to go to, I think it was Iran, I think it was Iran or Iraq, or I'm not even sure which one it was, but it was uh, the desert storm. And so they, they put put my my ex on alert to go. And so they made us take classes on how to write checks and all this stuff. And I was like, shit, he need to take the damn classes. I know how to write checks. <laughs> but we did, we had to go take a class on how to write checks and how to pay bills and all this stuff. You know, because they were on alert to go. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I how that stuff was. Yeah. No, and I kind of like that the Family Support Center did take the time to look at that, especially when you have so many um, active duty personnel marrying foreigners or whatever. And, you know, it was kind of a good thing. Yeah, but on the good. other hand, some of it was a little too remedial for some of the functioning dependents stuck there. Some of the some some of the wives that actually pay the bills, you know, because yeah, I was like, if I don't pay him, he's not going to. So, you know, I've always paid the bills, and like that's not ever a thing that I didn't do, you know. But but yeah, I understood yeah. that, and it's but it's crazy when you look at it in that situation. It's like you think that they would want to keep the family good and secure, so they could support the soldier. You know societally military all of them does anyone really care about the family nucleus anymore because yeah. if we put more of an emphasis on family we would have stronger communities yes and you know you can't have one without the other 
So since we've gotten away from a we the people and small communities and states that are still into community feel yeah. and pride in their state, well, who the hell cares about family? We're not even thinking about the basic of housing a human being, you know, yeah. food for a human being. I was going to say wages and employment for a human being. I'm let alone you, family. You, you don't care about our health care. None of that shit. You know, what none I mean? of it. None of it. Told somebody I said, to be such an amazing industrial country and then we keep giving money away to all these other places. And I understand what that's about. I understand it all. However, yeah. it's, it's to me, it's almost like this. Just because this is what we've done and this is what is done does not mean that that is right to do. That to me, that's where we are. It's like, you know, yeah, yeah, this is how we've always done it. But it's, you know, I always use the example when I talk about um, cutting the bacon in half. So like my grandmother cut the bacon in half. My mother cuts the bacon in half. I cut the bacon in half. My children cut the bacon in half. When we open the packet, we just automatically cut it in half. Now, why do we do that? Now they did it because I asked the question to my grandmother because I was the question person too. I said, why, why are we cutting the bacon in half? She said, well, back in the old days, you know, they had a, something like 15 kids. And, you know, but they lived on a farm. So it wasn't like, you know, they ever ran out of food or anything like that. Always had food. And so, you know, so she was like, yeah. And then, then they didn't have the big pans like we have now. So we didn't have that. We just had the regular, you know. And so, you know, and, but then you think about it. So, but why do the rest of us do it? I have a big pan that can, can, can cook a whole, you know, slice of bacon, but I still cut the bacon in half, you know? So I, I, I love that example. Cause it's like, yeah. You know, it, it's simple and it, God, it says it's 70 degrees. Okay. It's simple <laughs> and it makes sense, but then it's like, but why, you know what I mean? Like, like, but why, why do we, why do we still do this? And, and to right. me, it's so many, so many things in life just that way, you know, no, I agree. We've always done, right. We've always done this. We've always gone to church. We've always done this. We've always, we've always, we've always, but now we're, we are in the time of change. And right, right now too, because what are we upon? We are the upon age the Lions Gate. We're in age. Oh yes, Lions Gate. Yes. Portal. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I started feeling it probably yesterday, kind of, and then today, like I had some things I wanted to do before we got to this point. But girl, let me tell you, I didn't do any of that. Like, I mean, I I went out and. You know, I need to get stamps and, you know, a few other things and run by the store. And I had to go get my sister's birthday card and this kind of stuff. So, you know, and I typically, so I'm crazy. I buy birthday cards for my kids and my sister is like my baby because I'm 13 years older than her. And so I go and I buy cards for them and I put however old they are. That's how much money I put in it. So I do that like every year. And first my husband was like, this is so corny. But you know what? Them kids be looking for them cards. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. They be, they be like, Mom, my, my daughter-in-law, when they got married, that was one of the first things she said. Mom, am I going to get a card for my birthday? I said, yeah. I said, yeah, baby, when is your birthday? Tell me so I can write it down. Put you, put you in the rotation. <laughs> but what was the, when you moved, um, I want to know, what was behind when you decided to move to the, the Caribbean? What was, what was your, um, what was your vision behind that? So my vision for moving to the Caribbean was again, accommodating my mother. She's getting ready to make her crossing and she wants to do it in a certain setting and she wants to do it culturally um, the way she has always dreamt of. And so again, schizophrenia and Alzheimer's, a lot of fun. <laughs> a lot of places can't deal with that. So yeah. the That's Caribbean, really yes, the Caribbean was one of those places that revere their people with schizophrenia because they believe more spiritual based. Right. So I, they're looking for a possibility of building something for my mother, a facility that could take her. And then knowing that, um, my town of Lahaina had just burnt and coming back home was going to be a little challenging. 
I thought that this would be a good way to get my mother in one of the places that she asked for because she gave me a list. And if you look at my Facebook page over the last couple of years, I've been working that list. She said the cities and the states. I've been going through it. And um, so I thought St. Croix would be great. I knew it had great agriculture. I knew it was a little behind and that I could help uplift and elevate people. Um, sadly, it was too behind for me to stay there. <laughs> their people are still dealing with oppression. But now, you know, I have a couple of favorite categories of oppression, but they're locked in self-oppression because there's no way an island with all that beautiful fertile land should have anybody going hungry or have its inhabitants, its indigenous inhabitants making $11 an hour and calling that good. A supervisor at $12 an hour and that's good. Oh yeah, let your eyes go big because it is ridiculous. <laughs> and there is no more agriculture there. Local people struggle. They're trying to bring it back. Some of the farmers are struggling. The Master Gardeners program isn't getting up and elevated. And it looks and like a lizard I'm right behind point. you. You got hmm. a lizard right behind you. Oh. See right there? Oh, there he is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have lots of those. I was going to say they That's just came to the conversation. Dogs. It's okay. Yeah, you saw them because the, they blend their colors. Yeah. But yeah, it was um, it was too behind for me because I found myself saying, well, damn, even the Philippines was more progressive than this. And I was in the Philippines in the 80s. Okay. Uh -oh. Yeah. <laughs> so it was so in the ages for sure. that. Yeah. And the only reason I really pulled the plug is I had found a wonderful lady to help her with her farm. And in my first two weeks, I started getting her some grant money right away. But we all have trauma, drama, baggage that we haven't healed. And unfortunately for hers, it was reflecting in the way she was caring for her farm and the stewardship that she put in. Because I'm sure you're familiar with the adage about internal chaos always exhibits externally. Yes. And it doesn't matter if you're an organization, an individual, or a family. It yeah. shows, right? And that's what her farm showed. Mm. She had this hoarding tendency of like, when she took me to her mechanics, there's eight cars she's proudly pointing out. None of them work. The car she's driving in is her mechanic's wife's car. So when you have that trauma drama baggage and you're not looking at the losses and how those losses have triggered you to start hoarding, et cetera, you can't get anywhere. No. But for me, when I'm looking at myself like a gift horse and I just said I could get you money and in my first two weeks, I'm showing you ka-ching, ka-ching. And I'm like, okay, you need to bring in solar water. And I know of a grant that's seven figures. Take a minute and write me out your bio. Mm -mm, that's TikTok. Grants are on a deadline. I shouldn't have to ask you twice, three times right. for something that I'm doing for you. And so I let her know that, you know, volunteering, doing this free, that, I wasn't going to break into her emotional baggage as a holistic practitioner because then I'm doubling down and then reciprocally, I need some kind of energetic exchange for that. Absolutely. But yeah, the dysfunction was at the point where she's still trying to rent it out as a farm Airbnb. We've now lost septic. So there's no bathroom, there's no water. And she actually still had a guest. Um, so that's when I was like, okay, I've been to the dysfunctional rodeo before. I got a belt, a silver platter, a couple of trophies. I'm out. I'm done. <laughs> yep. I love, it. And I love I, it. No, I started singing the little song that goes with that mentality. These boots are made for walking. And I just got the and fuck that's just up. what I'll do. <laughs> yep. Yep. Oh, all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'd like to say that was the first time I energetically get myself into these barter situations with someone that seems like they're functional and just didn't have someone with tools to help them. But sadly, it's not, which is one of the reasons why I decided to step up and own my background as a holistic practitioner and start charging people, have those contracts. Because when I haven't done that, Every time I'm just giving it away out of kindness, the backlash when we get to that, ooh, you just said something that made me have to think about how true that is. You know, I just recently told one of my clients that um, 
this all or nothing mindset pity party that they're throwing for themselves is beneath them at their level because this person happened to be a doctor. And I was like, no, I ain't got time for that. Right. I'm here to do this, this, that for you. You need to accept that gift without what you're giving me back. And so um, that's where I'm at because I've always seen it, even with my great grandmother, if she was going, my great grandmother and my mother, they're scryers. So they like crystal balls. Mm -hmm. um, I like water and crystal balls. So I scry with my water. I have an obsidian bowl, but um, I used to see them do all this work. And if the person couldn't pay, my great grandmother would tell them, well, go out to the garden and find me something to come bring me. And she didn't well, care if you brought a flower or a rock. Exchange. I'm sorry. I said, it's an energy exchange. Exactly. Exactly. That's what currency is. That's what money is. That's why whenever I give, I give with my right. I take back with my left because I want to keep that full circle going. Yes. And um, so, yeah, that's where I'm at now. It's like, oh, we won't be doing the free to kind or I probably still will, but I'll be watching. Well, know, the, the, the thing is, is once you get it in your your heart and your mind that it's time for you to charge and all that kind of stuff and then you ask you know the spirit what is a good thing and you know what feels good to you and it shows up then you charge that but yeah. if you if you meet somebody that you know really needs help and you know that they really need help and you know that they'll follow through and all this type of stuff and you want to give it to them for free or for something real real cheap because I still say some type of freaking energy exchange, even if it's 20 bucks. Yeah, something, yeah. You know, something so that they have some skin in the game. Here's my last payment for something with someone. And it's just a wonderful um, spiritual nice. bead. So, you know, I totally get it. You know, so something. That's because, you know, because like I, I go on TikTok and do stuff. And I tell them, I said, it's an energy exchange. I said, you can either give me something on my cash app or you can give some gifts. I said, it doesn't really matter to me. I said, because I know that I am supported. I know yeah. that I'm taken care of. I said, but this is an energy exchange because not only do you have to have this, but I have to have this. I said, Absolutely. I'm, I'm giving you something. Yeah. I said, because and if I'm giving you a reading and I'm talking to you and I'm yeah. giving you insight into whatever, I said, it's got to be an energy exchange. I said, because what yeah. I know is that when you don't have the, that you feel, you the healer, you feel it. And you yeah. wonder why you be feeling, you know, in different ways, you're feeling bad, you're feeling aggravated, people, you know, start getting hell on your nerves and all that stuff. It's because you are not having energy exchanges and you feel yes. like you're pouring, 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 and you're not receiving anything. You know, like you're giving, 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 and yes. your giving and receiving cycle is all out of balance and all out of alignment. That's that word, right? Alignment. Yes, absolutely. And I want to come through and just give you a big high five because I was just saying that to someone else because what I'm seeing here, you know, Maui, we've had a lot of struggles and um, a lot of our energy and light workers, they're drained because they haven't reciprocated. They haven't replenished their own spiritual wealth. Yes. And so I'm hearing them running around with like labels and assumptive behavioral thoughts about how someone asks. And it's like, oh, what are my healers doing? We ain't supposed to be doing that. There's no label, filter, or anything. Uh uh. We're the good, the bad, and the ugly. Hmm. I don't have time for that. So, well, like, it's I not have just there, it's all over. Okay. And I'm seeing, seeing it on the line online too on some of those apps. And I'm seeing it and I'm like, you know. Yeah. And see, this is the wrong time because I get it. So many have been off on their own, being an army of one or two, but now we're uniting. We've got Aquarius and Pluto. First time in so long. Lionsgate, like you were saying, everything. This is our time. Yes. And I don't know if you saw there was this sister and she was breaking down truth about how our world leaders have always sought seers and advisors and everything yes. and that they know what's coming. So they're trying to shore up and get the last of their money and dirt that they can get done and everything. Yes. This is not the time for all of us workers to be falling apart and having yes. a moment, but yes. that's what the other side is going to want energetically. So they don't have our mighty alignment and well, able to that. break through. Yeah. Pushing that agenda. And that that's, and I'm telling people, I said, this is not the time 
to be separate. This is not the time to be running around here talking about, you know, the white women and the black women and the Latinas and the whoever else is and the, all the people all over the planet. It's not the time for that shit. It's time to come the hell together and let's do this thing because we know, we know what this could look like if we don't. Yeah. You know? And it's, and I tell, I'm, t I be telling them all the time. I tell, you know, I tell my lighter skin sisters, I be like, listen, this is not the time. This is time for us to come together and collaborate and start trying to get this stuff out into the world so that we can help to heal this damn yeah. shit. I said, because this is a shit show that we're in. This is no, a chaotic place. Absolutely. And you I know? don't watch the news anymore, okay? So, like, my grandfather had issues with me when I was, like, in fourth grade. He was like, Melissa, you can't watch the news anymore. Because Russia had me just like, what are they doing, et cetera. And I would take it so personally because it is feeling like my mission to heal everything, right? Yes. So watch the news to this day. I know how they oversensitize everything. But as everyone's talking about the upcoming election and everything, which I'm trying not to pay attention to because so, I don't even know if I'm going to be a so person. Do I get right to my mouth? I mean, who do I not for my president? But here's what I do know. And I don't need to be paying attention. Trump will bring us into civil war, foreign wars, everything all at once. And like I was mentioning, Sister was talking about world leaders and everything. The last time we had the same planetary alignment, we had the American Civil Revolution going on, and we also had another war going on. And so, you know, it's just we've got to remember what matters. You've yeah. got to get back to individuals wanting to connect and interact with other human beings yes. in real time and yeah. not all of this online presence. If I see one more family on vacation here in Maui sitting at a table, but they're all on separate devices and no one's uttering words to each other, I think I might have to just go to the beach and do some final screen. I mean, because it's just ridiculous. It's it is, ridiculous. though. It really is. When your family here, you're not connecting. So I think we just need to remember how to the individual, family members, then community, and build from there. And I think my last thing on that, especially family, okay, I get it. I could be the poster child of dysfunction. I am the only child that got to stay with my mother. It was not a piece of cake. My mother literally would set my bed on fire. I'd wake up to a burning bed, okay? So it was not a delight, okay? Uh, that great... was going to say, that does not no. sound fun. No, no, no. My great sense of smell is probably from these early things. But here's the thing. I knew that wasn't my mother. I knew that it was her mental illness. I knew she didn't ask for it. I didn't label her as toxic and think it gave me a free touch to walk away. I realized that for every psychotic episode, she was well enough to have her doctor help me process and understand it so she could lessen my damage, that she made herself available for any of those hard questions, and that I participated in her counseling session, not because I needed it, but I need to understand a woman who has a different way of interacting based on her mental health issues. That's awesome. Some family members today run around with, oh, that person's toxic because they're bipolar, this, that, and other. Meaning they're toxic because they have a mental health issue. You can't understand their over emotive way of communicating. You don't want to participate in family counseling and do anything to heal your family unit. So it's just the label of toxic and you get to walk in. And that's what happens well, so many times. I was going to say, is this is, this is that, that, um, that culture. Think about it. We're in the throwaway culture. You know, we throw we throw away our old people. Yep. We throw yep. away our mentally ill. Yep. Throw away anything that's different. You know, uh, autistic and ADD and all these things that I know that I have, but I've not ever been diagnosed. But I'm no, I'm sure of it. Like as sure as I know my name, I know that these are a part of me that I've been. But I mean, I'm, they've, they've been a part of me for over 50 years. So why should I bother with it now? <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, I learned to navigate a lot of things, even though I have thought about it sometimes. I was like, maybe I should go get me some Adderall or something. 
might help me to focus. <laughs> Herbs and plants that we can talk. About. Yes, I was gonna say because I'm not. I'm like, no, I'm not doing all that. I was like, I didn't even allow them to diagnose my daughter because they kept trying. Like she was little, you know. She, oh, you know the teachers. I said, well, here's the thing. I said, when when you get your your medical degree and shit like that, then you could come and talk to me about this. But since you don't have that, then we're not having this discussion. I said, and we teach our children to say no to drugs. <laughs> so what would I be like trying to give them one? <laughs> And, you know, and at that time, too, though, that thing was new. You know, you, you think about this is before Columbine and all this stuff, because that's what mm -hmm. those kids were on. Right. So I was, before all that, I, I told him, I said, I don't believe that that thing has been tested enough to see what the long term effects are on these children. I said, you trying to give children drugs at seven and eight and nine years old. I said, their bodies are not even developed yet. I said, and you like right. stuff that you, you don't know what it's going to do. So I decided that, you know, my child was not going to be a guinea pig or a fucking statistic just because she's yeah. a young, you know, young black girl. Oh, now, I get it. Doing that. So, I get it. So, you know, so I, I think about when you said the labels and stuff. Huh? You like the jeans and two cars and you want to pick them up. So I'm right there with you. Yeah, no, we're not doing that. It's like, no, I'm not doing, you know, and the thing is, is. You know, we were talking about labels and that that brought this stuff back to me. I thought, because I, I was talking to, I think my daughter-in-law and I was like, everything is a label now. Everything is a label. I said, back in the old days, I said, we always had people that were probably autistic. You know, we had them. Yeah. We had, you know, we had crazy Aunt Sue. You knew she was just crazy. Everybody yeah. knew. You, that's just, you know, that was her. You know, crazy Uncle Joe, you know. We knew that the, that's what they were and you just dealt with them accordingly and stuff. You knew you couldn't come at Uncle Joe, you know, with no craziness. Right, right. You know, stuff like that. And it's like, we knew these things. We had, I remember kids in school that they probably definitely were, you know, something was going on with them. I said, but we just knew. And, 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 and you know, but now it's like, everything has to have a label. Oh, you're this, you're that. Like, like my doctor came to me telling me, talking about, oh, you're pre-diabetic. I said, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. I think I said that thing to her three or four times. Yeah. He said it back to me and I just looked at her, I said, no, I'm not. I said, that's a label that you guys put. I said, and the other thing is I've been around because I'm probably, you know, almost twice her age. But I said, I've been around before you. I said, and I remember when they changed those numbers to make everybody pre-diabetic and make everybody hypertensive and stuff. I said, because I remember when the numbers used to be. So I've been doing this. I've been in this field. You know, I said, I said, I've been in the medical field probably longer than you've been alive. This is what I said to this girl because she was a young doctor. And I told her, I said, so I know. I said, so no, I'm not taking on anybody's label. <laughs> I don't care what you say. <laughs> no, and I love that you fought for yourself and had that great advocacy because the labels are ridiculous. The other thing that's going on is I'm seeing friends interacting and it's like, the the same thing, the labeling or the putting words in your mouth, you're feeling frustrated. I didn't say I was feeling that, but please yes. do tell me more. And it's like, for me, what I always trip over is if I don't say anything to you about your behaviorisms, how you interact with me, what gives you the right to sit there and label me? Like if I'm too emotive for you in a moment, why does that have to be a label but I just watched you have a meltdown because somebody took your parking space and you just turned into an angry driver ready to run them off the road. But, See, oh, wait, I was too emotive in a moment. <laughs> that's why I don't do a lot of people. <laughs> I tell people all the time, I'm like, my circle is so freaking small. Like I, I went out with a friend last night and, and we actually met at a job, you know, and then we just became fast friends. We were, you know, just sweet. And I was getting ready to go skate me. She called me and I said, I'm getting ready to go to skate me. She said, where you going? And I told her, she said, well, I'll come. I said, okay. She said, you was going to go. I said, girl, I don't care. I will go by myself. If I want to do something, I'm going to go and do it. I said, I don't worry or wait on nobody else. I said, honestly, sometimes I have a better time by myself. <laughs> Sorry. But seriously, I was like, no, circle is so small. I'm like, mm -mm, no, I don't, I don't want, I don't want any of that. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, no, no, I, I, I try to be with people that you know love me, and people Absolutely. I, 
you know, I, yeah. I tell people, I'm like, I, most of my friends I met online, girls, like some of them never in person. I'm meeting people now because people are coming through like, girl, I'm going to be in Seattle. I'll be like, oh, girl, let me know, you know. But seriously, I'm like, you have to keep them circles small because people be just insane and crazy. I didn't know you were in Seattle. I wish I had known that when I was there last year or was it the year before? Yep. And I was here then, too. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know what? Seattle broke my heart because um, I had lived there 12 years. That's where I ended my social work career okay. after being told I was too altruistic to be in the field. Really? Bus service alternatives for Washington, uh, at-risk youth program over at Kent, Washington. Okay. Um, but what broke my heart because I did time with the tenants union and helped get laws passed was when I was over at Pike's Place Market. Mm -hmm. And saw what goes on at that Target and that luxury high rise with the little doorman. But you got to step over bodies doing fentanyl and bodily fluids and getting locked down in Target. I was like, oh, yeah. It's like mom can't come here for her last days. <laughs> this mm -hmm. ain't the energy she wants to go out. <laughs> um, it's too much. Like we live in Everett. So it's too much. And it's all kinds of that. That problem is, you yeah. know, we, we bought some land. So we're just. I'm just getting everything together so we can get our house. We're going to put a manufacturer yeah. on because our and plan is just to, you know, my husband is retiring. I have already semi-retired. I have already decided I give, I don't care. They keep telling me you got so many years. I said, no, I don't. No, I don't. I said, yeah. I can't continue to do this. So I already no. know. I was like, no, I, I get it. Yeah, I get it. You because sure I'm, <laughs> I, I can't live in the city. I've done time at Harborview. I was like, oh, nope, don't want this part of social work there. Um, we had a little farm in Ording because I need my farmland. So I had my little two and a half acres. Could sit in the hot tub and feel like you could throw a bottle of Mount Rainier and it just bounce it back and forth. Drink my wine. It was good. Play with my plants. It was good. That's why I left social work. Plants don't try to stab you, cuss you out, spit at you. You ain't got to have a boss tell you you care too much about these Look, people. Allegations on you for, for doing your job. Yeah. All that. That's what I tell people. I say the whistleblower thing. I'm, I'm I've telling you. I'm telling you. I I think I worked five days last month because I work on call now. And to be honest, I'm like slowly uncalling myself out the freaking door. <laughs> I, I love it. I'm so happy for you because you know what? When I left social work, it was kind of bittersweet. I felt like the true grassroots hippie child that I am that really mm -hmm. cares where someone can say I'm altruistic. Yes. <laughs> Didn't be leaving. Ain't that what you're supposed to be to be a um, social worker? That's what I thought. But okay. you know, mm -hmm. hey, I, I live and learn because um one of the hardest things for me was I was hanging out with these group of co-workers and we were doing everything you do when you're partying, smoking, drinking the whole bit, right? But I came back to the residence with autistic clients. And I found them smoking and drinking on the job and I dined them all out. But guess what? I was the one that got relocated within the organization because no one felt like they could feel safe working with the snitch. And I was like, fuck y'all all day because if that's how you work in, then that's on you and not on me. So so much of that. You, you're almost like, what? I just, but you know, like I, I had to tell one of my, one of my CNAs the other night, I said, listen, I said, um, he was telling me about something. I said, you know what? I don't even complain about it. I said, because when I took complaints to them, which, you know, I said, I took complaints. I said, when I took the complaints, guess what? They told the person that I brought a complaint. I said, and I knew they didn't tell me that they did, but I could tell by how the girl was reacting with me. And I was like, Oh, this is some crazy stuff. So that taught me that I'm not telling anything. I don't even care. I was like, yeah. I honestly, and, and you know, what's wild is I tell them that I said, I don't even care. I said, I come in here to take care of these people. I said, do these eight hours. I said, I don't want to do eight hours in two minutes. I only want to do eight hours. And then I would like to go home. I said, and that's it. I said, I, I said, when I come here, I'm going to do what I need to do. These people are going to be taken care of. I said, some of that other stuff will probably not get done. Yeah. That's it. And y'all might. Yeah. I would love to find, well, I'm going to create my own, but a workplace that really 
supported anyone that was spiritual energetic being that was intentionally living because um it is so hard i mean your own <laughs> yeah yeah and what's going on out here in the retail world is ridiculous i just left a job as a store manager after seeing that my staff members were dealing with people defecating in the fitting rooms having sex doing drugs and for the organization it was okay, okay. yeah and it's like no that's not okay they're not even until somebody sues well, you know, I was there a very short time and I was just speaking on the improper handling of these things and saying nice little emails like, well, I'm confused because I'm new, but that's not the way I ever did it with OSHA Park, or we don't throw sharks in the garbage after rinsing with bleach. By the way, that whole bleach thing came when we didn't have a good needle exchange program. <laughs> it wasn't what we were supposed to be doing. Girl, we have sharks in the break room that aren't even in sealed containers. And we don't know what airborne or bloodborne pathogen is in there. And they're not disposing of them because it's not at the fill line versus in a hospital, the fill line is to let you know it's time to go and they move through it. But in a store, if you only have three in that puppy, you got to get them the fuck out and you're not washing it with bleach. And so um, that was my nice little five week job as a store manager and then I was out the door. Because they could hear the whistle coming. <laughs> oh my God, we are kindred spirits. I have I have them laughing. I said I had a job. I said I lasted five weeks. Matter of fact, the girl that is the DNS where I'm working now was like the she was um I don't know the hell what she was um one of those supposed to be a trainer you know um staff development. She wasn't that, but that's that was her title. And so anyway, I worked that place for five weeks. I was out of there so fast. I They had got a, like a note, like at the end of the shift, I wrote a note and I put it in the box and I said, this is my notice. <laughs> I'm out of here. I can't do this another day. <laughs> it's I, I like that. Sometimes I don't even take the time to do that. But with them, I was like, yeah, so I'm all set. The internal investigation was BS. I'm taking an external. I told them this like, a week in advance because I had already started making the phone calls and reporting. It was like, I'm open and notorious about it when you're in the wrong. It's like, I want you to come at me because I want to name you because you're an organization that is supposed to make my social work and my retail background feel good. Yes. And I should have the will to want to stay with your store. But you happen to have a history of employees falling in trash compactors and getting killed and you're not taking yes. care of. I and mean, then the developmentally disabled people that you hire while speaking good and all the will that you have to rehab people, they don't live up to it. So I was like, I'm out. <laughs> yeah. What do you say? No, I, I just but, you know, a lot of people are doing that now. Yeah. And I don't know if they know, but this younger generation, they are not putting up with the shit we did. <laughs> I know. And that's why we they can't get not. people to work anywhere. That's no. why. Well, you got to think about it. You can't get people to work if you're not going to pay them. Yeah. Then the other thing is, too, you know, a lot of times people, especially like in the fields that we were in, people will stay if they're being treated decent. They'll stay. The job might be shitty, but they'll stay if if they're be, being treated decent and kindly and, you know, every now and again, you know, throw a pizza party at them or give them some chicken or whatever, you know, like like one place I worked. I hated it, but I do appreciate the way that they did. Like if we work short, which we were always, you know, pretty much, you know, but we work short. They would send us food. Pizza. Nice or, you know, Subway or whatever, you know, chicken sometimes, sometimes, uh, you know, Asian food, because of course there's a lot of them. And so, you know, but they would do that. And I appreciate that. I thought that was amazing because at least it made people feel like somebody gave a shit about, it. you know, yeah. and it really is a thing. It's like, if you make people feel like what my Angelo said, you know, people will forget what you did, but they won't forget how you made them feel. Absolutely. And that's the and, truth. And it, it's funny because with this last job, I was quoting Maya Angelou, when someone tells you about themselves, believe them the first time, because they have this production goal, a hundred, one rack per person, a hundred pieces on a rack per hour. 
while these employees are working without heat, I'm sorry, AC, like stifling heat, I threw up just doing 45 minutes in the facility where they were working. So I'm telling them, well, my grandfather owned a shirt factory and he's the first man of color to own one in the whole world. And that he also made it a co-op with his employees. So I'm telling you that I come from a different caliber. I understand factory, but we take care of our people. What and you the can hell do did you think I was going to do when I saw those circumstances? I was going to say, and you can do that. Yeah. It can be done. But, you know, people just, you know, I really feel that we're in a time where people are getting back to that. Where we're gonna, I believe we're gonna see more mom and pop shops, more people coming together. I, I just, I just feel that, and I've been, I've been feeling it for a while, and so I'm, I'm looking for it. You know what I mean? Like my eyes are open. All right, we're gonna land this plane because we've been on this thing for I don't know how long, but I'm so grateful for you showing up for me and and just coming and you know sharing your magic and your light, and I, I just really appreciate that. Um, I do have a question though that I ask all my guests. If there was one thing in the world that you wanted to change, what would that be? Shit, that's tough because that's a trifecta question for me. I'm always about my threes. It's a spiritual thing. Mm -hmm. For me, truly, I think I'm going to have to say it would be the loss of family constellations and the desire to preserve families. Because for our race, we get destroyed. We don't get to have the generational wealth, the generational passing down of family heirlooms, et cetera. And our families end up so broken and scattered. We don't so even we, know. Wow. We don't even know. Yep. You know, I'm, I'm actually going to Salt Lake City and one of the places I want to stop is to the genealogical place because I want to go and see if I can find me some ancestors <laughs> because you never know, you know, and I, I, I hold out a little, you know, a little hope, you know, because at first I was like, but when the, the young lady that told me about it, she was, um, she said, yeah, she said, because I said, you think they, they would have some stuff for, for my lineage? And she looked at me, she said, yeah. She said, because they have stuff back to like the 1600s. And I was like, really? And she said, yeah. She said, you'd be surprised. She said, I had a friend that went there and she she was like you. You know, she was not like us. And she said, um, she said, and she was able to, to find some connections. I said, really? She said, yeah. I said, okay. I said, well, I'm going to be there. So I might as well try to get up in there and see what I can see. Well, I wish you all the best. And next time you'll have to check out my root work that I did last year oh, because yeah. I found relatives in addition to doing the root work and going to ley line places. St. Croix was one of those. So yeah. the day of the dead, I was at a plantation my ancestors were at. That so, is so oh. interesting. See, oh, that, yeah. that's the kind of stuff that I think is just amazing that we couldn't, you know, we couldn't find out. And even ancestry, I don't even know. I don't know how true that is, you know, like I said, because there's so many variables and so many things that we know that, you know, they didn't pick up on. Yeah. But we know what that's about too. But, um, so let the people know, um, if you have a program or you have anything that you're doing or that you're looking to enroll people or anything like that, just let the people know, um, that um, and then if you have links, I'll, I'll drop them in the um, description as well. I have a lot coming. I'm actually working to get, um, so right now I do have um, my Facebook page, the Renaissance Guild. Um, also on Instagram, I'm there under Merm Witch, Mermaid and Witch combined. Oh. But also Renaissance Connection, yeah. I didn't know that was you. <laughs> oh, okay. That's got me. You. That's me. That's why there's a mix of art and activism and food. Yeah, that's me. Um, Cause that's always my thing. And hopefully next time we talk, I'll be talking about my business and getting brick and mortar destination place um, up and running. So I'm trying to do a lot, but I'm going to keep fighting the good fight and so get out there. And are you doing like a retreat center or what are you doing? So I guess in a way, for the tourism end of it here, it would be a retreat center. 
but the goal of my business has always been a holistic home and garden store. So oh, everything okay. by great, made by artists, gifts, everything. Yeah. However, yeah. one different. If you want to learn to paint, you want to do floral arrangements, you want to do pottery, come on down because we do that. And it's a bring your own bottle type environment. Have some fun. Great, talented artist. So for here, the retreat part comes. You're going to be on the island for two weeks. Oh, we've got a two-week course for you. Aromatherapy, two weeks, you know? That's nice. So Herbalism. That's what I'm looking for. That's that, what I'm working that, for. Oh, my God. I can see that. That is going to be amazing. I'm so excited. <laughs> and it's for us. The primary, I mean, it's for everybody, but the primary people that I created this for was for all of us, social workers, light workers, energy workers, first responders, Nurses. because we can a heavy load and we always have that balance of healers and artists but we don't ever have that outlet my outlet was a menage a trois with ben and jerry's and waiting i'm still waiting for russia to give me a refund on all the damn stolies and martinis i would need to have at the end of my day over some silly mission statement not being able to be as real as our deed so <laughs> We need healthier outlets. So that's who I'm thinking of it for. Yeah. This is actually a program my mother had created many years ago. Mm -hmm. So I'm still keeping the family business going in a way. I understand it. I, I understand it. I, I understand it. Because I say that all the time. I say, I had a talk with my mom and I said, you know, I feel like I am, you know, adding to her legacy, my grandmother. I said, I feel like I am that person. And I've known that I was that person, but I, I battled it, you know, for decades. Now it's like, okay, I'm that person and I'm supposed to be here. You know, this, this is where I'm supposed to be. And this is what I'm supposed to be doing. So I am so excited and I appreciate you sharing time with me and energy and being energetically here together. Cause that is what it's all about. And I absolutely enjoy you know, the conversation that we had. Um, I hope that all of you have enjoyed this conversation. It's been amazing. The piece that I can see on Melissa, because I've seen her in other times where she didn't look as peaceful, but the piece that she, that's on her today is, it makes me feel so freaking good. <laughs> you know, It's like, oh my God, you know, because I, I often can, can feel um, when people are... Um, rattled and out of alignment and stuff like that I didn't realize that I had that gift until I did and then when I did I was like okay what do I do with this you know <laughs> what do I do with this you know where do I take this where do I go with it you know but I'm 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 trusting and I'm at a place now where I just know that God is lining it all up showing me you know bringing me downloads bringing me, you know, people that I need in my life, all of those things. And everything is just doing what it's supposed to do. So I'm just so excited about your center because I can feel the energy in it and we need it so bad. And especially for uh, people of color, because we need this, you know, it's almost like one of those things that you don't even know how bad you need it until you get it. It's like if you never had a massage and then you go get, get a fabulous, wonderful, amazing massage. You know, you didn't even know you needed that in your life and then you got it and now we're here. So I'm super excited for you. And if there's anything I can do to help you when you get ready to, you know, start to market and open and all that stuff, make sure you come back on the show. We'll talk about it some more. Hopefully we can push it out there and get it out there because that is my goal. Um, I think, Demi, it should be a remote show from here in Maui. I think I you do want to go. I, I'm good with it. Matter of fact, I, I was just talking to my husband. I said, I was invited to this thing to speak in Paris. I said, but you know what? I'm not going to do that right now. I said, because even though I, girl, I already looked at the flights to see, and I was like, it's, it's really not. It's really pretty reasonable. But we have, you know, this trip, and then we have where we're going to Alaska on a cruise. And so it's like, mm, I don't want to do that right now. <laughs> We've got wedding next year, you know, so it's like, okay, but I'm just, I'm just so grateful just for the opportunity just to be here. You Thank know? you, Tammy. Yeah. This is so great. And I'm trying to put this together for months. 
like this. I know. <laughs> I know. Thank you so much for your patience. Because <laughs> I mean, I was doing the thing out there. I thought I was building the farm. I was doing those little videos and talking about the water and everything. And so I thought we were going to have a great podcast and I was going to uplift this sister and help build the farm. But we got to finish doing some healing first. So I'm I glad you made it. It wasn't for that. Yeah. Because I mean, even when you reached out to me, I said, it's okay. I said, I said, girl, don't even worry about it. I said, when the time is ready, when the time is right, then you'll come. I said, and I'm okay. I said, whenever it is, I'm going to still be doing it. I said, because I've been doing this show for I think, five years now. <laughs> I said, I said, and I'll still be doing it because I enjoy it. I get, I mean, I, I really do. I get energy from talking to my light worker people, you know, and all the, the healers and the channelers and the psychics and the mediums and the, the human design people and the astrologers and the numerologists. I guess you got, me, you got me as all of those, the human design, everything. See what I'm saying? So I just, I do, I love these conversations because we just geek out on all these things. So anyway, thank y'all right. for joining. I appreciate everybody for watching wherever you're watching thank you for subscribing sharing and liking and all of the things and letting other people know that we're here and we're doing this work and we are here to help humanity and help the chaos be dispersed how about that so thank Beautiful. you so much and thank you melissa for joining i am so grateful for you and i appreciate your time i appreciate you and being here peace and blessings everybody yes yes all right.